All right, so I'm going to be doing another expository teaching. This is going to be on the book of James. So this will be for a few weeks. And um, so, Father, we just thank you for your revelation that you have because your word is revelation. You are revelation. And every time we break bread, we break open the Bible, we break open your word, life springs out. Revelation comes forth. Lord, it's alive and living. It's alive, full, full of resurrection life, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We don't have to ask for you to anoint what's already anointed. That's your word. You are anointed, Lord. So thank you, Lord. And Jesus, give us hearing ears. Amen. All right. So, praise God. James... Uh, in the Hebrew is Jacob. So truly, James, when you go in, in the Bible, it's actually Jacob. And, and so I looked up the word Jacob, and we all know that Jacob means what? Surplanter, supplanter, right? So I looked that up. I looked it up in the dictionary. Supplanter means to take the place of another as through force. Remember Jacob? Remember, he had a name change, didn't he? As through force, scheming and strategy or the like to replace one thing by something else. James was a radical believer. He was a radical, courageous, on fire apostle of the Lord. And he came in with a message that was there to shift one thing into something else. His message was really geared to the Jew, to the Messianic Jew. In fact, James was, was sent to the 12 tribes. Okay? If you look at that, we're going to be going through that. But I want to give a little history about this, about James First of all, he was recognized as the just one. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to be recognized as? The just one. David, the just one. I received that. Judy, the just one. Right? Ivy, the just one. Leroy, the just one. Wow, what a... And, and this has gone down in history. This is written in history. Uh, so who wrote the book of James? You know, there's... A few James in the Bible. And so it's widely believed that the James that wrote the book of James or Jacob is the brother of Jesus. Okay, the half-brother of Jesus. And I didn't know this, but James was not a follower of Jesus during the time Jesus was on earth. You know, he was a brother. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, he didn't, he didn't follow Jesus. In fact, there's two scriptures I want to give you to prove it. Mark 3.21 says, while Jesus preached and taught, his brothers stood on the outside. They were sort of on the outside of things. And then John 7.5 says, for even his brothers did not believe in or adhere to or trust in or rely on him either. Isn't that something? It's when James saw the rex resurrected Christ is when he came to Yeshua, when he came to salvation, okay? All right. Uh, and, and, and it's also interesting, Peter singled him out among all the other Christians, uh, and, and, and that was in Acts 12, 17. And James made the deciding speech. He was one of three that made the deciding speech at the Jerusalem Council. This is in Acts 15, 13. And that's when Paul called him a pillar of the church. And he was one of the deciders that they were going to take the gospel now to the Gentiles. They were going to take it out from the, from the Jews only and take it out to the Gentiles. Okay? So when was it written? All right. When uh, one of the chief leaders, James is one of the chief leaders in the church at Jerusalem. James wrote from that city prior to the meeting of the Jerusalem council which decided they're going to take out the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. 
And that was recorded in Acts 15. At that council, James, along with Peter and Paul, affirmed the decision to take the message out. And that council met in 49 AD, AD 49. And, uh, but James, so that means James wrote his book sometime before that, 45 to 48. Why is this historian, this historian, among others, making that coming to that conclusion? Because in the book of James, there's no mention of the Gentile church. There's no mention of, you know, Christian. It, it's written to the Jews. It's written to the Messianic church, okay? So something that significant, that decision in, in 49 was so significant because it shifted the focus from, uh, from the Jews now to the Gentiles, that he would mention that in James, okay? So there you go. And the content, it's practical. I love the content of this book. It is practical. It's, it's really sort of like, as you read it, it's sort of like a Christian. It's like a New Testament Proverbs. It has wisdom in living a holy life. And I tell you, pre-service today, boy, I tell you what, it was, it was humming. There was a word. I don't know if Terry taped it. Did you tape that word that went on for an hour? It was, we need to start taping pre-service because there's things happening in pre-service that sets the whole atmosphere. But he's a holy God. He's a holy, loving God, but he's holy. All right. Um, and, and the interesting thing, and, and, and it's, just, it's James's uh, death. The death of James. It's, it's pretty amazing. His martyrdom. All right, this is coming from, I'm going to read from a man, a historian named uh, Eubius Pamphilius. Okay, he's a church historian. This is what he says. But the, you know, Sadducees and Pharisees couldn't stand it anymore. The Jews were frustrated with James, and they planned to entrap him. They told him to renounce his faith in Christ and his teachings in front of everyone. And so they concocted a plan. James was all the more bold then and declared him not only as Savior and Lord, but as the Son of God. Now, let me tell you, those Pharisees are ripping their, whatever they have to rip, they're ripping it at that point. Okay? He just went overboard. All right, this is what it says. I'm going to read this. But they were unable to bear longer the testimony of the man who, on account of the excellence of his virtue and of piety which he exhibited in his life was esteemed by all as the most just of men and consequently they slew him. He alone was permitted to enter into the holy place for he wore, wore not woolen but linen garments and he was in the habit of entering alone in the temple and was frequently found upon his knees begging forgiveness for the people. So that his knees became hard like those of a camel in consequence of his constantly bending them in his worship of God and asking forgiveness for the people. Because of this exceeding great justice, he was called the just. And oblius, which signifies in Greek, bulwark of the people and justice in accordance with what the prophets declared concerning him. Many people, including rulers, came to Christ because of his teaching and his preaching. Isn't that cool? Therefore, when many, even the rulers, believed, there was a commotion among the Jews and scribes and Pharisees who said that there was danger that the whole people would be looking for Jesus as the Christ. Coming, therefore, in a body... They came all together to James. They said, we entreat thee, restrain the people, for they have gone astray in regard to Jesus as if he were the Christ. We entreat thee to persuade all that have come to the feast of the Passover concerning Jesus. A big crowd, Passover, was there. 
Okay, they knew. They had strategized at the time they were going to set, they thought, James up. Okay? Lots of people there. We're going to make a show of James openly. Everyone's going to hear him denounce Christ. Everybody's going to denounce Christ, and this thing will be over. For we all have confidence in thee, James. For we bear witness... In thee, as do all the people, that thou art just and does not respect persons. Do thou therefore persuade the multitude not to be led astray concerning Jesus, for the whole people and all of us also have confidence in thee. Stand therefore upon this pinnacle of the temple. It's interesting that same pinnacle that Satan tempted Jesus. Remember? That from that high position, high places are very important, thou mayest be clearly seen, and that thy words may be readily heard by all the people from all the tribes, with the Gentiles also, the Gentiles also, are come together on account of the Passover. The aforesaid scribes and Pharisees therefore placed James upon the pinnacle of the temple and cried out to him, said, Thou just one, in whom we ought all have to have confidence, for as much as the people are led astray after Jesus, the crucified one, declare to us, what is the gate of Jesus? And Jacob came forth and said, with a loud voice, not some wimp voice, Why do you ask me concerning Jesus, the Son of Man? He himself sitteth in heaven at the right hand of the great power and is about to come upon the clouds of heaven. And when many were fully convinced and gloried in many, gloried in the testimony of James and said, I love this. Hosanna to the son of David. These same scribes and Pharisees said once again to one another, we have done badly, you think, in supplying such testimony to Jesus. But let us go up and throw him down in order that they may be afraid to believe in him. Now the pinnacle is a hundred feet high, ten stories high, okay? And they cried out saying, oh, oh, the just man is also in error. And they fulfilled the scripture written in Isaiah, let us take away the just man. See, they misinterpreted that, didn't they? Because he is troublesome to us. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their doings. So they went up and threw down the just man and said to each other, let us stone James the just. Now, this is what happened. We were on the south side, south steps when we went to Israel. And Paul was talking about James. And, and, and they said that when they threw him down a hundred feet, he did not die. He did not just die. He got up and continued to preach. Now, I tell you what, we get a little persecution at work, and we can't, we stop preaching. Can you imagine this awesome man of God being thrown down a hundred feet, and he still preaches? So then what stoning was in that day, you know, we have pictures, and there were times where they threw stones, but... More than not, they would drop people from the pinnacle and then they would take boulders and drop them on top of the moving body from a hundred feet. So that's what they did. And he still kept moving and preaching. He still even threw. He didn't say, oh, my poor life. Oh, my gosh, I've just fallen a hundred feet. Oh, he was preaching until someone took a club and he went to heaven. They hit him in the head. He went out preaching, not just a little bit. He was vocally, he was bold, he was courageous. The just man of God. Amen? 
They buried him right there on the spot, they said. I tell you, every time people walk past there, the ground cries out. The just man. I want to be known as a woman that is bold and courageous, not just some wimp that drops away when I get persecuted. And let me tell you something. I'm just going to be honest. There's been times in the recent past where I've wanted to throw in my mantle and I've wanted to throw in the towel. But then I look at God and I look at these men of God and I think, no way. I'm going to finish the race that Christ has called me to. Verse 2 of James, and I will consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever I am enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. I count it all joy. I count it all joy. I count it all joy. I count it all. Be assured, verse 3. Let's turn to James Chapter 1, verse 3, it'll be up there on the screen. This is the Amplified. Be assured and understand that the trial, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear the history of James. It brings you understanding to his book. Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. And I've said this before. We've said this for years. The invisible realm, the Lord exhorts us to look at. Don't look at the things that are seen, the circumstances, because they're subject to change, right? They're going to change. But you look at the invisible realm because it's eternal. God is depositing inside of us during trials, especially those in the back row, that precious woman. He's depositing a weight of glory in us. When we have endured trials, when it seems like I can't do this anymore, I remember there was that time when we went through, I remember literally saying, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And you've heard me say, I said, kill me, God. Kill me, oh, kill me, God. And I would, I literally, he was watching me, you know, because I'm dramatic. And so I got on the floor. And do you remember this? You know, I can't get down as easy as I used to. There we go. And, and I go, kill me, oh, God, kill me, kill me. Oh, God, kill me. And this is what David did. He just sat there and looked at me. <laughs> he watched me crawl. And he just sat there and watched me do it. And then when I had my temper tantrum and my hissy fit, I got up, and you know what God said? I heard it as clear as day. I got up, and you know what he said? He said, gladly. <laughs> he said, gladly, I'll kill you. I've been waiting for you to say, kill me. Your flesh has to die. That stuff has to die. That yucky stuff has to go. But during that time, God, even in my mess, God was depositing a weight of glory that led me into and ushered me into the next season of my life and empowered me for the next season. God is empowering you through these trials. I've almost come, I say almost, to the place where I'm fully embracing them. Because I know God is working out something in me that's going to absolutely blast hell apart. So when the trial comes, instead of going, don't say anymore, don't say anymore, I go, you know what, devil? Bring it on, baby. 
Because I know there's a weapon that God is going to deposit that the enemy will regret the day that he even touched me. And he's been doing a lot of regretting, I'm telling you that. Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith brings out endurance and steadfastness and patience. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing. That's who we are. We read Romans 8, remember? We were not created through Christ. In Christ Jesus, we can live a sinless life. Our nature has been transformed, right, Al? You know this. You're an awesome teacher, awesome man of God. You understand covenant. God made a covenant with us. We are a new creation in Christ, we have the divine nature inside of us. We don't have to say, well, the de- you know, the devil made me sin. I did. Bull. Yes. <laughs> the devil didn't make you sin. You made yourself sin. Yes. He came and all he can do is one big fat mouth of hot air. He comes and he lies and he entices. And he, that's, he's one big mouth. That's all. He's not some big dude. He has a, he's a little tiny thing with a big fat mouth. And he comes. Don't ever come to us and say, the devil did this. He made me do it. I just can't help myself. That is a lie. You are filled with the dunamis power of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. We lack nothing. So what that means, fully developed, lacking nothing, no defects, it means in every part, every part of us, no part lacking, no part unsound. That means in your mind, your will and emotions. If you're having an anxiety attack, snap out of it. Because you're sound. You have sound mind. You don't have a spirit of fear. You have power. You have love. And you have soundness of mind. That's who we are. You're complete and whole. This is what the Greek, this is what the Hebrew means in this. You're complete and whole. Spirit, soul, body, mind, will, emotions. You are free from sin and you are blameless. Isn't that awesome? First yeah. Thessalonians 5.23 confirms this. And may he keep your entire being, spirit, soul, and body without blame. Yeah. So be it. Yes, First Thessalonians 5.23. Oh, shut da, 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 When you're attacked, just like David was saying last week about fear. Because fear is really the root almost to everything. Everything. Fear or love. Fear or life. Fear is the root. So when the enemy comes to attack you, like I have a fear, and, and we touched on it last week. I loved it because he talked about it being a treasure. Fear camouflages a treasure. He doesn't want you to get to it. It's in you. But you can't see it because fear is covering it over. Well, I have a fear to fly. I I just can't fly. I I just have a fear to fly. You know what you do? Get a ticket and fly. You face it head on. You face it. You run after it. You don't run away from it. You run to it. Do you think we wanted to start a church? We already know that story. Start a church. I'll tell you what, that was really not in our plan. <laughs> I mean, who are we? I mean, we're not. Well, goodness, we can evangelize, love them, and leave them. <laughs> you know what I mean? No messes, no stuff, no hurts, really. You know, you don't have to get in their life. You know, you love them, and then they leave you, and then, you know, love them. You know, they leave you. That's what happens. In evangelism, you love and leave them. 
in church, you love them and they leave you. <laughs> right? I tell you what, we just said, no, oh, we're afraid of that. We're not qualified, God. It really was fear. You know, we would just fight, well, you know, it's not our calling, but it was fear because we did not. And God said, I anoint whom I call. I'm calling you. Not experience, not education, not ordination. I am calling you, and you better say yes. And we said no. And it got to be. Talk about trials. Oof. If any of you is deficient in wisdom. Okay, so when you're going through trials. And, you know, sometimes we take scriptures and we take them out of contents. And we don't really uh, get to uh, enjoy the richness of what the scripture is really saying. We hear, oh, you know, if you need wisdom, just ask of God. Da, da, da. Well, let me tell you, when you're going through a trial, you need wisdom. Don't you? Because the enemy's right there to go, why? What did you do? God must hate you. Look at everyone else. Their grass is greener. Their kids are prospering. Everybody, their church is bigger. Look at that. He comes to all of us with those little voices. Who can relate? Right? That's when you need to go to God for wisdom immediately. Because it, you have two choices. You go to the pit of hell and listen to the enemy work up a case in a storyline of how awful you are, or you can immediately go to God and say, God, give me wisdom. I need wisdom about this trial and this tribulation that I'm going to. You are wisdom. You know exactly what's happening. I am no longer going to say, why? Oh, God, why? Is this? Oh, why me? Why me, God? Why me? Shut up. You say, God, I come to you for wisdom. How are you going to turn this around? What am I getting in my inner man as a result of this? How are you seeing this, Lord? Give me wisdom. And he will give to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault finding. And it will be given him. Only it must be in faith that he asks with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers, hesitates, and doubt is like the billowing surge out in the sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. And that's exactly what happens, doesn't it? I mean, you just get, your emotions get crazy. You're just like, the, you know, you're just all over the place. You know, David has said, not anymore, because I've really gotten good. <laughs> But it was at a time past where something would happen. And I literally, within five minutes, I could turn that thing into an NBC miniseries. Just like that. I could go, David goes, how do you do that? How do you go from this and you've created a monster? And I had to pull this thing in. I had to pull it in. I had to pull those thoughts in and begin asking God for his wisdom on the situation. You know, some of you know what I'm talking about because you do the same thing. Or you did, remember, a long time ago. Okay. For truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything if he asks from the Lord. For being as he is, a man of two minds, another double-minded is hesitating, dubious, irresolute. He is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything. He thinks, feels, and decides. Wow. I don't want to be known as that. Do you? Here's James. I tell you, he was resolute. He was on top of a hundred foot pinnacle. 
Think about that. He's up there. I mean, I don't think there's railings because that's where they tossed people. So he's up there, and he's declaring he could have lived. They were giving an opportunity. They were setting him up. The enemy always sets us up. It sets us up. He wants to make a show of us, and then God makes a show of him. Now, did they think that on his, at his dying breath that he would still be preaching God? So instead of causing people to be fearful, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't shut your mouth about Jesus. Look what happened to him. Yeah. Right? The people came in droves. Yeah. Persecution brings forth harvest. We are seeing our brothers and sisters overseas in Iraq. They are saying that it's almost annihilated Christianity. They say on the news, it's almost annihilated. And then I hear a laugh from heaven. Because I'll tell you, there's an underground church. And it's exploding. And all of the sudden, out of nowhere, this tongue-talking, devil-slaying being called the body of Christ will rise up out of ashes and take Iraq for Christ. So get a piece of paper. We're going to do a little exercise. Don't worry. I'm not going through all of my notes. We're going to get through this as we get through this. Okay. But it's important that we actually put into practice what we're hearing. This is how you meditate on the word of God. This in your private time at home, this is what we're supposed to be doing. It's not just rambling through our daily read that we have. It's studying the daily read. It's digging out the nuggets and treasures in our reading, okay? We don't want to just put a check mark and go, check, check. All right. I want you... You're going to write down a trial you are facing at this very moment. Now, some of you I heard, now, I don't know which one to pick. (laughs) So I'm going to pray for Holy Spirit to show you the one that he wants to highlight right now. And then I'm going to ask Holy Spirit to show you and to bring into light the truth about it. What he says, what, how he sees it, so that you're, you begin to practice this, so that immediately you exercise this. Every time something happens, bam, okay, God, here I am again. What's this all mean? So, Holy Spirit, would you show me? I give you permission to show me what you are highlighting right now in my life a trial, a hiccup in my life, a hurdle, a mountain. Show me, Holy Spirit, the specific one that your light is on right now. And then, Holy Spirit, show me how Papa sees this. Show me how the king of the universe, my Abba, sees this seated on the throne, looking down on the enemy who's under his feet. How am I supposed to see this, Lord? And then just start writing as he gives it to you. We're going to take a couple minutes.
Okay. I'm sure some of you just fell asleep. That's okay. Anybody want to share? Any, anybody want to share? Yes, of course you would. Let me come over. I'll come to you. Waiting for our financial breakthroughs. He, told, he showed me two sides. On the one side, camels are coming in loaded down. Ships are coming in, raining diamonds and jewels. On the other side, flesh is dying, patience increasing, and the gift of giving is growing. That's revelation. See, what you just wrote down, it's revelation. This is God speaking to you. When somebody says, oh, I don't hear God. That's why I love doing this, because surprise, you just did. You just, who wrote something down? Let me see your hands. Guess what? You heard God. You heard God. Anybody else? Marty? Okay, the trial is the pain in my body. Um, and the result is the lack of doing all that I love to do, I can't do. Uh, and the Holy Spirit said to claim healing, to declare healing over me, yes, God. to keep my focus on the Lord and not the pain, and to do what I can do in my physical, to strengthen that, the opposite side of my body. Amen. Amen. So practical. He was giving you practical instructions for your physical body to strengthen it to go forward. And then the supernatural is declaring healing. So, Father, we as a body declare healing over Marty. From the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, we declare order and alignment in her skeletal system, in her skeletal uh, body. Lord God, we speak order now. Strength to her bones, Lord God. Strength to her bones in every area of her body. Mm-hmm. Muscles yeah. all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, I'm heading over here. Heading over here now. I'm going to go hit over here. I had two over here. Somebody's hand. I thought Crystal C. All right. So I'm at a crossroads right now on a lot of things, and um, fear is at the base of it. And I've been gone for a month, so I'm catching up on sermons. I'll have to get yours, Pastor Dave. Um, So he let me know that part of what slowed me down is um, not being willing to fully let go of thinking of a man as my source, and that I was hanging on to both, and that that wasn't getting me anywhere. And he said specifically, which was very cool, (sighs) he said, letting go of man fully, taking my hand into freedom and deeper relationship, trust and intimacy. Do I want to live in this world, in the systems of the world, or do I want to enter into heaven's currency while living in the world? Which system did I want to operate under? Slavery or freedom? Natural or supernatural? Limited or unlimited, serving man or partnering with God. Who learned something? That's revelation, Crystal. That's what happens when you go to God and ask for wisdom. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and finish next week. But, you know, asking God in the moment that a trial hits, the moment that a temptation hits, instead of yielding to that, go to God. Just go to God immediately. Look up instead of down. Okay, down is the temptation. Down is the muck and the miry uck that the enemy wants to drive you to, okay? But when you look up, who's there? So instead of down, look up. God, whatever it takes, demonstration like that, you know, crawling on the floor just didn't work. 
he, I think you sat there like that. I think you had your arms folded like this and you were just looking at me like I'd lost my mind, which I had. Because that's what happens when you allow the enemy access. You go nuts, right? You're ready to say something. I've got the mic. Is this good or bad? I, the Lord, he's the only one that really knows how to really uh, touch us and change us. Um, and I, was, I would just say this to all of us. If we just remember this, not only is there a treasure behind every fear, but there is a treasure from every assault that the enemy would bring your way. So knowing that there is a great treasure, look to the treasure, look for the treasure. And you know what? You, we, there, you are a bunch of prophetic people. All you do is just take a moment. Okay, Lord, what is the treasure behind this? And then begin to declare his very word in that very treasure. It is most profound if we'll just do what he tells us to do. Amen? Amen. 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 Very good. Did you notice we matched today? Yes, we did. That was not on purpose. Isn't that fun? All right. Well, Father God, thank you for your goodness. <laughs> Lord, thank you, Lord, that you have limitlessness. You are limitlessness. You, you live in that. And Lord God, we thank you that we can come to you for wisdom in all areas of our life all areas of our life. We have access and we have not used it. We have not accessed it. So Lord God, today we choose to access what's part of our inheritance is your wisdom. And you don't just give us a little, it's liberally overflowing wisdom is coming down on our behalf. Hallelujah. So as your heads are closed, her heads are closed. <laughs> Don't close your brains. They're open. <laughs> your heads are bowed. You know what? No, I want all eyes open. <laughs> Who here has never received Christ, and I'm speaking to those watching too, as a personal Lord and Savior? Who here... Um, has never received Jesus, and you want to do that today, I want you to come up boldly. If James can fall off of a mountain, half of a pinnacle, and keep preaching, let me tell you, those watching, you can come to Christ. And how you do that, just email us. And we're going to pray here real quick, uh, and I'll, we'll be praying with you. And those that would like to receive Christ in the room, come up. Those that have backslidden, those that maybe don't feel like you are as on fire for Jesus as you used to be, and you want another dose of the Holy Ghost, come up. And those that aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't have your prayer language. I tell you, that's a whole nother weapon. Now, does that make or break you? No. You're going to heaven if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you what, we need everything we can have on earth that God has provided and access to all of it. So if any of that is you, come on forward. We're going to end, but come forward, talk to one of us, and we want to pray for you. So for those watching, say this, Lord Jesus, you know me. You created me. You've already forgiven me. So as an act of my will, I receive the gift of forgiveness. My sins are not going to be wiped out. They've already been washed away by the redeeming blood that you shed on Calgary. I receive fully my salvation. I receive fully all who you are in my life. I exchange my old rags for royalty. I invite you 
into my life. Change me. Renew me. Restore me back to who you created me to be. I am brand new. That old has passed away. I am a new creation in you, Yeshua, Jesus. In Jesus' name, in your name I pray. Amen.